Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 3 2022 NFL predictions. Well, after the great Week 1 that I had, definitely my straight-up picks and my against the spread, or definitely not a good against the spread week, but my, my straight-up picks, going 9-6-1, and one, the NFL will always continue to show that it will always slap you across the face from week to week. Because this week, your boy the Fanatic had a, let's just say, pretty dreadful week in terms of all my predictions. So, against the spread and straight up, against the spread, I went a very unfortunate 5-9 and nine after starting off with the Thursday night game of the 27-24 victory for the Kansas City Chiefs, getting the 3.5 point cover and the straight up win. After getting those double there, the Jets came back from 13 points down with under two minutes to go and blew the six and a half for the Browns. You had the Commanders get trounced by the Lions. Shout out to Halfwood's Picks. Job well done for Dan Campbell, Motor City Campbell, and all those line, lines over there. Getting down to a 22-0 lead. They ended up winning the second half of the game, 27-14, to but that really nearly wasn't enough. Uh, Carson had two really two horrible turnovers. One that resulted in a safety and the other high interception to Will Harris, which kind of shifted the game there. So that that game blew. Uh, Trey Lance, best of luck wish to him. Uh, he unfortunately broke his right ankle off a rush, and he wasn't doing bad for the game. He was already 2 or 3 for 30 yards, and had already um, completed a, a couple rushes himself, but he's fractured his ankle. He's out for the remainder of the 2022 NFL season. And that means that the old man, the old reliable veteran quarterback in Jimmy Garoppolo is back in the saddle once again for the gold 49ers. And uh, I think that is a, actually a positive development. And for Trey Lance. And I know it's going to be harsh, but I think two things. He is injury prone, and I would say he is a capital B U S T bust. Because I, if I am the 49ers... I do not want to have a 23- or 24-year-old quarterback entering his third year of professional quarterbacking, only having four career starts, and already having a fractured ankle, a sprained, uh, a, a fractured ankle, a sprained hand, and I, I know he suffered a third injury in his first two years. That That's something to where, depending on how far the Niners and Jimmy Garoppolo can go, I would argue to bring Jimmy back for a, another one-year deal or maybe even like a one-year, 20-plus million dollar deal to make sure Trey can maybe try to learn to develop that way. But that game absolutely blew because I took Seattle plus 8.5 and, and they ended up only scoring 7 points off a Michael Jackson or Mike Jackson because they don't want to confuse the young rookie cornerback with the King of Pop um, with the touchdown and that blew. Uh, the Raiders had an 8-point lead. That thanks to a very bad or a very phantom holding call on uh, the one young Raider defender, which gave Kyler Murray life to get the two point conversion, and it took then took a delay a game <laughs> to go five yards back, and then Kyler Murray threw an incredible pass to AJ to AJ Green in the back of the end zone, and then Hunter Renfro fumbled twice on the next drive for the Raiders, which cost the Raiders that game 29-23. So that's what they went that game. And then the Bears-Packers game, there was moments where if the Bears would have made a fourth down touchdown run, they probably would have been able to cover the 10 points. So that's how just all those picks against the spread just went to the crap. And I ended up going 5-9 and nine against the spread. And straight up, I'm, I am I was barely hit, keep my head above there at 7-7. Seven and seven. So now overall for the year against the spread, I'm 11-19 and 19 against the spread. And straight up, I'm now 16-13-1 through 30 games. Um, that equals up to 37% against the spread and straight up. 55%, so definitely a down point to where I uh, want to be through two weeks of the year. There still is plenty of time, plenty more games to pick throughout the next several weeks, but definitely the against the spread picks are kind of trending in the typical direction that I usually get, and the straight up picks are usually going in a little bit of a southward direction, a little more, more south than I usually like to have at this point. But I am hoping this week, with all the new information that we know, all the new changing parts, hopefully I can get that changed and in positive direction. But it was just a crazy weekend in the NFL. I talked about Jets, Browns, Cardinals, Raiders, Dolphins, Ravens, my beloved hometown Baltimore Ravens team, Mike McDonald 
had our defense have bigger holes than the, the ones that they dug in the movie holes with Shia LaBeouf. Boy, you could have dug down and saw kissing Kate Barlow and kept digging holes into her grave of how big those holes were. Uh, man, we blew our largest uh, tied with our biggest blown lead in franchise history, 21 points. The other time the Ravens did that was October 5th, 1997 against the Pittsburgh Steelers many moons ago. Uh, but that was just a painful loss. Two attack of Viola, 469 yards, six touchdowns, two interceptions, having a, a career day. The ninth quarterback since 1950 to have 450 plus passing yards and six touchdowns. And the second QB to ever have six passing touchdowns in the game right alongside Dan Marino. And nobody would have ever thought Tua and Dan Marino would ever be in the Dolphins record book together. But, you know. And for Lamar Jackson, look, he had a sensational game. He had his longest career rush of 79 yards. He broke the record that he's had with Michael Vick for his 11th career 100-yard rushing game. And for him and his performance, he did everything he could to play and play well. So that is not on Lamar and the offense. The offense put up 38 points. Rashad Bateman had another big 75-yard touchdown. Uh, we started the game with a 103-yard kick return touchdown from Devin DuVernay, which was incredible. But that is just an all-time loss that for Mike McDonald, maybe in my emotion, I would I, I want to fire Mike McDonald for that horrific performance. And the Mike McDaniel, good for you, sir. Like, you know, I don't think you're coach of the year right now because for two weeks, Brian Dayball is doing a more impressive job with way less talent. And anybody had the Giants going 2-1 on their bingo card, uh, very good for you. You are either a diehard Giants fan or you love uh, Daniel Jones or your Daniel Jones family because those are the only people that love Daniel Jones that much. <laughs> um, but um, it's one of those things to where I think Brian Dable right now is the coach of the year just because of what, what he's done. But Mike McDaniel is doing a heck of a job in Miami. Kudos to him. And I think that game right there will determine the wild card perspective. And I think the Dolphins kind of have that edge. Even though the Steelers, hey, well, how the rest of the AFC North win? I'd already talked about the Browns game. Steelers, Pats, that was awkward. Um, and, you know, they were able to win off a Gunnar Oshevsky muff punt, which was incredibly tough. But the Steelers, you know, losing that one, good, good way to open up Akrasher with a loss to the Mac Jones, Nelson Aguilar, uh, Damian Harris-led uh, Patriots, where even a Nick Folk missed a 52-yard field goal that gave him more life. Um, but there was that. And then the Bengals, the defending AFC champions are the second Super Bowl team to start out 0-2 over the last 20 years. The other team to do that was, unfortunately, the 2015 Seattle Seahawks, led by Russell Wilson and that happy bunch. But they lost to the Rams and the Packers in the first two weeks. And I believe that was when Cam Chancellor was up, too, so that, there was a little bit of correlation there, but tough for the Bengals there. Uh, you know, trying to think of... And then you had Indianapolis and Jacksonville. What an absolute drubbing by the Jacksonville Jaguars. 24 to nothing. Eight straight wins now in Jacksonville against Indianapolis. It was their first shutout victory since 2018, and the largest margin of victory they've had in a single game since 2017, which was the last time when the Jaguars made the playoffs. So Trevor Lawrence had a good game. He clearly outclassed Matt Ryan. And for Frank Reich and, and a guy I like, Chris Ballard, I think it might be time for both of them to go because that Colts roster, I know Michael Pittman and Alex Pierce were out, and I knew that ahead of time, and I probably maybe if I had, you know, hindsight, I would have changed that pick. But that is the worst team in the National Football League by far. Like, that offense just looked inept. That defense was letting James Robinson, you know, cook him. They had Jonathan Taylor and James Robinson out outplayed him. And that's with the Colts having nothing around him. Um, the leading receiver for the Colts was Doolin. With, I believe, like 78, 79 yards. If that's your number one receiver, I, I know they lost options, but that's just a really bad football team. That even if you had Jacksonville winning, and I knew some people that actually, good for you, but good lord, the Colts. Like, that is the worst team in the league. They just looked inept, and Shaquille Leonard and all those guys were going to make up 24 points to make that difference. So, you know, that was a notable story. Um, the Cowboys and Cooper Rush getting a big win. And I think I hit all the big big stories. The Falcons almost having a reverse 28-3 moment. They were down 28-3, and they almost came back. And if it wasn't for Jalen Ramsey jumping over Brian Edwards, the Rams would have uh, been able to do, uh, lose that one. Uh, but they did. Thankfully, though, the Falcons didn't make that comeback, so I got the ten-point cover. So, um, with that one, so, but it was just a crazy week in the NFL. And once again, five and nine against the spread, seven and seven straight up. Tough week for your guy, the fanatic. But it's a brand new week. It's a brand new slate of games. 
and hopefully I can right the ship and move in a positive direction moving forward this week. All right, so time for my picks for week three. Quick picks and explanations. So this Thursday, in the second TNF primetime game on Amazon, streaming on Amazon, when the one-on-one Pittsburgh Steelers travel to Cleveland, they go on the one-on-one Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns are three-and-a-half point favorites in this game. Give me the Cleveland Browns here, minus three-and-a-half, and the Cleveland Browns straight up. Then on Sunday, when the 0-1-1 Houston Texans travel to Chicago to take on the 1-1 Chicago Bears, the Chicago Bears are three-point favorites in this game. Give me the, in one of my three upset picks of the week outright, uh, give me the Houston Texans here in an upset, plus three, and the Houston Texans straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-2 Las Vegas Raiders travel to Tennessee to take on the 1-1 or 0-2 Tennessee Titans, the Las Vegas Raiders are one-point favorites in this game. Give me the Las Vegas Raiders here, minus one, and the Las Vegas Raiders straight up. Then the next game, when the 2-0 Kansas City Chiefs travel to Indianapolis to take on the 0-2 Indianapolis Colts, the Kansas City Chiefs are six-and-a-half point favorites in this game. If there is one lock of the week, and I know for everybody out there that's playing survival, I, God bless you, <laughs> with all the different games that you could have picked, Cincinnati-Dallas, uh, Jets, Browns, uh, Ravens, Dolphins, if you thought that we could win. Gosh, did you have a rough time and anybody still playing in survival pools, best of luck to you. I, I never like doing them just for that reason, but good for you in that way. Uh, this is, but if you're playing in survival, take the Chiefs this week. If the Colts somehow pull off an upset, then the whole league is just topsy-turvy and I don't know what exists anymore, but, uh, I digress. Uh, when the 2-0 Kansas City Chiefs travel to Indianapolis to take on the 0-2 Indianapolis Colts. The Kansas City Chiefs are 6.5 point favorites in this game. Give me the Kansas City Chiefs here. Minus 6.5 and, and the Kansas City Chiefs straight up. And then the next game, when the 2 or when the 2-0 or 1-1 Buffalo Bills travel to Miami to take on the 2-0 Miami Dolphins. The M Buffalo Bills are 4.5 point favorites in this game. Give me the Buffalo Bills here to win straight up. But I'm going to take the Miami Dolphins plus 4.5. Then the next game, when the 1-1 Detroit Lions travel to Minnesota. To take on the 2-0 or 1-1 Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings are 7.5 point favorites in this game. Just do copy and paste what I just did in the last game. I am going to take the Minnesota Vikings here to win straight up. But give me the Detroit Lions plus 7.5. Then the next game when the 1-1 Baltimore Ravens travel to New England and Foxborough for the Patriots home opener. To take on the 1-1 New England Patriots. The Baltimore Ravens are 3 point favorites in this game. Give me the Baltimore Ravens here. Minus 3 and the Baltimore Ravens. Straight up. Then the next game, in a very bizarre and awkward way, when the 0-2 Cincinnati Bengals travel to the 1-1 New York Jets, the Cincinnati Bengals are 4.5 point favorites in this game. Give me, and I know it's probably going to sound the weirdest out of all these, you know, double picks I'm making, give me the New York Jets here plus 4.5, but I'm not that dumb. Not yet. I am going to take the Cincinnati Bengals straight up. So once again, give me the New York Jets here plus 4.5, but I'm going to take the Cincinnati Bengals straight up. Then the next game, when the 2-0 or 1-1 Philadelphia Eagles travel to Washington to take on the 1-1 Washington Commanders, the Philadelphia Eagles are four-point favorites in this game. Give me the Philadelphia Eagles here, minus four, and the Philadelphia Eagles straight up. And then the next game, when the 1-1 New Orleans Saints travel to Carolina to take on the 0-2 Carolina Panthers, the New Orleans Saints are three-point favorites in this game. Give me the Carolina Panthers here, plus three, but I'm going to take the New Orleans Saints straight up. Then the next game, when the 1-1 one one Jacksonville Jaguars travel to Los Angeles and SoFi Stadium to take on the 1-1 one one Los Angeles Chargers, the Los Angeles Chargers are 7-point favorites in this game due to the circumstances with Justin Herbert and his rib. Um, I'm going to put that into consideration. Um, and regardless if he plays or not, I'm going to take the Los Angeles Chargers straight up. But with that injury, I'm going to take Jacksonville plus 7 on the line especially after their performance uh, on Sunday. So once again, I'm going to take Los Angeles Chargers here straight up, but give me the Jacksonville Jaguars plus seven. Then the next game, when the 1-1 Los Angeles Rams travel to Arizona to take on the 1-1 Arizona Cardinals, the Los Angeles Rams are four and a half point favorites in this game. Give me the Los Angeles Rams here, minus four and a half, and the Los Angeles Rams straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-2 Atlanta Falcons travel to Seattle to take on the 1-1 Seattle Seahawks, the Seattle Seahawks are two and a half point favorites in this game. In my second pure upset of the week, give me the Atlanta Falcons here, plus two and a half, and the Atlanta Falcons straight up. Then the next game, when the 1-1 Green Bay Packers travel to Tampa Bay to take on the 2-0 Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 
The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are three-point favorites in this game. Give me Tampa Bay here, minus three, and Tampa Bay straight up. Then the Sunday night game when the 1-1 one one San Francisco 49ers travel to Denver to take on the 1-1 one one Denver Broncos. Uh, when this game, when I saw this game last night, this was a two-and-a-half point spread. The last time I checked, and if anybody can give me an updated number, I believe it's been picked, cut down to a pick em. I, I believe that's the whole Jimmy aspect coming in. So in that sense, I am going to take the San Francisco 49ers against the spread and straight up to beat the Denver Broncos. <laughs> and then finally, the Monday night game in one of the great NFC East rivalries when the 1-1 Dallas Cowboys travel to New York to take on the surprising 2-0 New York Giants. The New York Giants are 2.5 point favorites in this game. After what I saw at Cooper Rush and what I know from the history of the Cowboys, I'm going to take my third pure upset here. Give me the Dallas Cowboys here. Plus 2.5 and, and Dallas Cowboys straight up. Alright, so time for my quick thoughts on each game. Pittsburgh at Cleveland. Uh, this is a game to where... Look, Cleveland... This is a great, fun stat that I'm, I don't know if anybody heard. So the Browns blew a 13-point lead in the final 1 minute and 22 seconds of the game. NFL teams had won the last 2,229 consecutive games when leading by at least 13 points in the last 2 minutes. The last team to blow that lead were the Browns back in Week 9 of the 2001 season against Chicago Bears. So I think that's absolutely hilarious. Um, I thought, you know, that's just a great irony there, and that is just an all-time brutal, typical Cleveland type of Brown loss. You know, that's unfortunate for them, but it's Cleveland, Ohio. There, there's a reason why they believe in its name. That's a tough one. Uh, but Cleveland overall, though, Nick Chubb had a great game. He had 87 yards and three rushing touchdowns. He actually, he missed red, and I, I know it's hindsight, and I, again, I didn't think that Cade York was going to miss the extra point or the other field goal that he missed before. But basically, he did it against the uh, Texans where he went down the one-yard line and let Jacoby knee, knee it out. He had already passed two-minute warning and got the first down. If he stops the one-yard line, the Browns win that game by uh, by set or by seven, I believe. And I get the win, Andy, against the spread cover, and everybody's happy, but that didn't happen. Um, but I look at how um, I look at how Cleveland played. I thought they played a pretty much a good fundamental game. I thought they got a lot of good pressure. Um, Jacoby had an up and down game. He really kind of shrunk at the end there. And that defense linked Garrett Wilson and Corey Davis get, you know, Corey Davis on that 66-yard touchdown was wide open and ran down the field. That was just an incredibly blown coverage and just shocking. But I thought the Browns that were just more fundamentally impressive were with the Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers apparently, from pro football reference, give up the second most passing yards in the entire league. And the, the Browns have weapons. They have Cooper. They have uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones. They have Njoku. They have uh, Harrison Bryant. They have Chubb and Hunt, you know, in the backfield. Like, they have a good enough offense. I've seen Adam and Deontay Johnson was their leading receiver <laughs> and he only had 57 receiving yards the whole game Mitch had a horrible interception to Adrian Phillips uh, through the middle of the game and basically the whole game if you watched it turned on Gunnar Roshevsky former New England Patriot he fumbled at about the 15 yard line and the blonde guy or one of the blonde players from the Patriots I, I forget what his last name was but he recovered it at the 15 the Pats scored a touchdown to go up 17 to 7 the Steelers drove down they got uh, Trubisky threw a touchdown the Friar move then they got the two-point conversion to make a three-point game. But then the Pats were just able to run the clock out and get the win. So, uh, But when I look at the and that's the thing, when I look at this Browns-Steelers game, like I also look at Cleveland's one of the last two games. Two of the last three games in Cleveland against the Steelers, the Cleveland Browns have won. And when, I, when it just comes down to it, their T.J. Watt wasn't there. They really couldn't get nearly as much a pass rush. They didn't get nearly as many turnovers. They actually committed two turnovers themselves. When they won the turnover battle the other day against the Bengals, this kind of didn't. It just didn't look well. And I just think the Browns have a better offensive line. They have the better running game. They have they have a better defensive structure. They have, they have their pass rusher. The confidence of what the Browns have. They knew they should have won. The Steelers got them in a way like they should have been more competitive, but that game was more back and forth. But I'm going to take the Cleveland Browns here just based off better offensive line, healthier team, more confident. I think Jacoby makes... One fewer mistake than Trubisky, and the Steelers go to one and two in a very kind of sad free fall. Where the Browns, through four weeks, if you could have told through three weeks with you know the shots suspended, they could be above 500 through three weeks with that schedule. They would gladly take that. So that's why the like Cleveland here minus three and a half, and Cleveland straight up. The next game, the Houston Texans over the Chicago Bears. Uh, this one is to me essentially coming down to quarterback play. Look, I thought Damian Pierce, he had a you know decent game. He had a little over four yards per carry. 15 rushes for 69 yards in the game. 
the other day. Um, Rex Burkhead was really the big uh, player, you know, week one. This time around, it was um, Damian Pierce, the Florida running back, who was able to get the number one job. Um, and then, you know, you had a couple of, you know, decent injuries to the Texans. Kevin Pierre Lewis and Jor- uh, Brevin Jordan left the game. Uh, and I thought they were going to lose Nico Collins. But apparently he just got caught up in the, uh, the net. Um, and I looked at the Houston offense, and it was, really wasn't that great. Uh, through two games, they have kicked five field goals and scored two touchdowns through two games. Uh, that's not really great. But when I look at the Bears, man, it's not that much better. Uh, Justin Fields has only threw for 70 yards. Uh, Dave Montgomery had a great game the other day, 122 yards. But it just, it looks awkward. Besides Daryl Mooney, they really didn't have anything. I don't think Cole Komet, the guy that they spent a first-round pick on, he, I, don't even, I don't even think he has a catch for the year. Their offensive line's in shambles. The Packers really, really, really get a decent pass rush. They, the play calling was questionable. Getsy tried this awkward shotgun fourth down call. Or many teams, you know, including a... They're, they're, you're running out of shotgun on fourth down, which I never, you know, quite understood. Because, like, that actually lets your, you know, linebackers get you further give you more room, and you have to move further to get, you know, to get shorter distances. If you're under center, you just have to just move forward. Um, and to me, like, in this type of game, where, look, I, I think the Texans have better receivers, better offensive line, the Bears have a better running back, it just comes down to accuracy. And Davis Mills, at least is, you know, through his career, you know, completed 60-plus percent of his passes. Justin Fields through... Two weeks is completed about a little over fifty or fifty-five percent, and he threw for seventy yards week two yeah, yesterday, and he threw for about a hundred forty. You know, so he really isn't that great himself. And I would just trust Davis to outplay Fields in this type of game. Could the Bears win? Sure, Justin Fields could make a play, and the Bears defense with their pass rush from Robert Quinn, they maybe could get it one more turnover. But also, I'm just going to go with the fact that Lovey Smith is due for a win. So, Lovey Smith, uh, you know, obviously was the last successful coach the Bears have had, or, well, the second most, or the most successful coach they've had in the, you know, since the century. Uh, definitely the most successful beyond even Matt Nagy, you know, who, who didn't do bad. But Lovey, in his two games when he was Tampa Bay Buccaneers coach, went 0-2 all-time against this former team in Chicago. So, I do think with what the Texans have shown, they've been in two good competitive games. The, Bear, the Bears showed you after week one that that was maybe more bad Trey Lance and maybe not good Bears. I think the Texans with Mills, with the confidence they have, with kind of the consistency they've had, I think they beat Chicago in this really awkward game. Uh, it's going to make one of these teams either, you know, for the Bears, a 2-1 and Chicago team. I did not expect that, but Chicago fans could at least have some hope that maybe they're moving in the right direction or just very fortunate with the schedule God's game. But, um... I'm going to take uh, the Houston Texans here just based off the better quarterback, better receivers, and just a little bit of a better coaching staff. So that's like Houston here plus three uh, and Houston straight up. The next game, the Las Vegas Raiders over the Tennessee Titans. Man, the Raiders, man. Uh, they were up 20 to nothing in the middle of the third. They were just rolling, moving up and down the field. Carr had two touchdown passes, about 260 yards. Played incredibly well. They were even popping champagne bottles at Allegiant Stadium as the way they felt really good. But then good old Josh McDaniels uh, reared his ugly head, and that bum of a coach is now responsible for the largest blown lead in Raiders franchise history. That is a genuine stat that I looked up earlier today. That is true. That is the largest blown lead the Raiders have ever blown in their franchise history. And that's thanks to good old Joshua McDaniels. The absolute scrub of a coach that he, how, how did, you know, how with a overtime and all that, how do you let Devontae Adams only get seven targets through a game? How do you not get Darren Waller, who they just paid 51 extra million dollars to not have in any type of significant impact? And your pass rush? Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that Chandler Jones, a very good pass rusher that the Raiders gave another $50 million to, do you know how many things he has done through two games? He has made two and a half tackles per game. 
and they only have one sack from their new near $100 million pass rusher, Max Crosby. That is awful. I knew Josh McDaniel sucked all those years ago when he was in Denver. Not only did he cheat in Denver, he was just a bum in Denver. The only positive thing Josh McDaniels ever did was draft Tim Tebow. Seriously. He basically gave the Denver run from 2011 to 2015. He was responsible for that because of drafting Tim Tebow. Nothing else Josh McDaniels did, even though you could argue the fuck, has ever been good. And it, it makes me smile because everybody was hyping up this Raiders team. And I knew just because of Josh McDaniels that they were probably going to be a, a much worse team than people thought. And I definitely think that Josh McDaniels, he probably should be able to win, you know, a game. They won't get fired. But this guy is an absolute scrub. He's 11-19 and 19 as a coach. He will continue to have struggles against this horrible division. And uh, if he loses the Titans, boy, this Raiders team might not even make the playoffs that way. So... But, you know, and again, I, I'm doing this video today, so obviously from the Titans before, I just think it's one of those things that I hope McDaniels understands, you know, what to do, even though I, I could see Derrick Henry with how weak that run defense is, even though James Conner, I guess they, they were doing okay, but James Conner did have to uh, leave the game with an ankle injury. Uh, for the Cardinals, um, I just think in a way, if they can contain Derrick Henry, I don't think Tannehill can outplay Carr. I think both defenses for the Titans, they have some good pass rushing aspects the, the titans have a little bit of a better secondary because they at least have kevin byard there but fulton's dealing with injuries they still have uh, caleb farley who's trying to come back from a, an injury and i'm just gonna trust Carr to overtake Tannehill in this game could ryan Tannehill outplay Derek Carr? sure could Derek Carr screw up this game sure but at the end of the day from what i've seen out of the raiders and what i'm expecting to see out of the titans uh tonight i just think Derek Carr and the raiders just be a little bit of a better team Look, I, I personally, you know, I might just for a couple seconds beat off the beaten path here. I'm rooting for the Raiders to suck. Because, again, like, I, I'm i not a big Derek Carr fan. I'm not a big Josh McDaniels fan. So to see that, you know, collapse, it sucked for my pick-wise, but I laughed my head off. Because I just want to show everybody that Josh McDaniels is an absolute bum. Okay, he's not Nathaniel Hackett, but Brandon Staley, nobody, you know, even Brandon Staley has his fault. Brandon Staley run laps, runs laps around Josh McDaniels. I'm sorry. Tom Brady carried his rear end for all those years. Do people realize that Josh McDaniels, when he was with the Rams after he got fired from Denver, he led the 32nd best offense in the league that year by himself. And then he went to New England like a whiny little punk and came, came back and got Brady, got latched back on the, the Bill Belichick teat and was able to survive for another 10 years. So, so, and with all that frustration being said, I'm still going to take the Raiders for all the reasons I just said. But... Uh, so that's why I give me the Las Vegas Raiders here, minus one, and the Las Vegas Raiders straight up. The next game, the Kansas City Chiefs over the Indianapolis Colts. Um, I'm going to take the uh, Kansas City Chiefs here because you are looking at argu you are looking at arguably, in my opinion, the second best team in the AFC against clearly the worst team in the AFC. Patrick Mahomes, this is kind of an amazing few stats that I was able to watch and uh, acquire from watching pundits and all that. <laughs> so Patrick Mahomes has the highest winning percentage in NFL history when trailing by 10 or more points in games. Since the merger, he has won 55% of his games when he's trailed by 10-plus points. The second-best quarterback to have a percentage is Tom Brady at 39% since the merger. That's an incredible difference. Also, um, shout-out to Nick Wright and First Things First. I know he's a Chiefs homer. I don't have nearly the bias that he does. But the Chiefs, when the Chiefs' defense still allowed 27 or fewer points in Mahomes' career... Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs are 45-1 and one in those games. That's insane. And also, he is now 22-3 and three against the AFC West in his lifetime. I believe the only losses he's had is to... He lost to the Chargers twice. And I believe the Raiders got him... Yeah, the, the, the Raiders got him a few years ago. In that crazy game where he had that uh, last turnover at the end. But the Chiefs, man, they, they have played really well. I'm going to congratulate Jalen Watson for that big 99-yard pick six that basically changed the 14-point swing. I thought Clyde Edwards-Alaire, who had eight rushes for 77 yards, played well. I wish Andy ran the ball more, but it's Andy Reid, so you know he really doesn't even like to run the ball in the first place. Uh, but I just think when you look at the Chiefs there, they are clearly you know one of the more consistent, well-rounded teams. They're making receivers out of Christian Watson, uh, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Juju. 
And you just look at the Colts and go, like I said before, uh, Doolin was their best receiver at 79 yards. And the Colts, man, Matt Ryan, what happened to him to where the Colts, if you're a Colts fan, you are missing 36-year-old Phillip Rivers. Like, Matt Ryan threw two games as one TD and four picks. They're the worst team in the entire league. They got shut up by the Jags. It wasn't even close. Like, Frank Reich and Chris uh, Chris Ballard, you guys got to pack your bags. Because this isn't going to get any better, I think, anytime soon. You might be able to compete in a couple weeks against the Titans, but against this Chiefs team? Uh-uh. No way. This isn't 2013 Andrew Luck where you made that big comeback. No. This Sunday, and no offense to any Colts fans out there, you are getting your boot stomped in eight feet underground by this Chiefs team of how bad, you know, they have been. Um, do I think the Colts have, you know, maybe a shot? Sure. I guess anybody has a puncher's chance in any games. Because, you know, through, through last week and just a lot of different games, you know, all the big things that you really expect, they never, you know, they sometimes don't even work. But I think of how well the Chiefs are playing, how rested they are, how healthy they are, and of how bad the Colts feel uh, morally, I think the Chiefs easily just roll over the, the Colts to get to the arena. That's all I can see here, minus 6.5, and, and Kansas City straight up. The next game, the uh, Buffalo Bills over the Miami Dolphins. I want to congratulate Tua and the Dolphins for an incredible offensive performance. You uh, had Tua become, like, like I said, a nine quarterback with six TDs, 450-plus passing yards in a game. And the stars of the game were the, their two, or, well, Tyree Kill, their $120 million man, and Jalen Waddle, their sensational first-round pick. Through the game, by the end of the game, here are their two numbers combined. 22 catches for 361 yards and four touchdowns throughout the game. They were both sensational. And they had a 28-3, you know, fourth quarter to win the game. Amazing. Um, and I think that, you know, the Dolphins are, you know, really good. And they are, to me, clearly right now, behind the Bills and Chiefs, the third best overall team in the AFC. I don't even think it's, I don't even think it's close. I don't even think you can put the Chargers, the Ravens, uh, the Broncos, any of those teams above, above them for that third spot. Um, I think there's a gap between the Chiefs and Bills and Dolphins, but that's just probably just because quarterbacks. Uh, but the biggest reason why I'm going with the Bills here is Josh Allen, ever since his first start against the Dolphins, he has won seven straight games against the Bills. Uh, I, I guess he, as for the Bills, they have won seven straight games against the Dolphins through his time. I know there's a big injury to Gabe Davis, and obviously with tonight's games, who knows how, you know, who knows how the Bills are going to play or what condition they're going to be in. But I just think the Bills' defense is much better than the Ravens' defense. I think they're going to be more effective. They're going to be able to contain the uh, uh, Dolphins' receivers better. And I think their pass rush with Espinaza, Oliver, Rougeau, Vaughn, I think they'll be able to generate a lot more pressure on Tua, which will make his day a lot more uncomfortable. Um, is, this is going to be a great game. And if the Dolphins win this game, not only are the Dolphins for real and they're going to make the playoffs, but they actually genuinely could win the AFC East. If they go 3-0 by beating the Ravens, Bills, and uh, Pats in three straight weeks. I don't know if it was in the exact order. But beating the Ravens and Bills in back-to-back -back weeks. With how much expectation people had for them. That's a heck of an accomplishment. And what a um, start for the Dolphins season. So that's why I like the uh, Buffalo Bills here to win straight up. The Miami Dolphins plus 4.5. The next game, the Minnesota Vikings over the Detroit Lions. Um, this is a game to where... Man, the Detroit Lions, what a performance against the Commanders. I wanted to root for my heart, but I just kind of, like I said to you last week, I saw one quarterback get a close victory. I saw one quarterback get a close loss. So I went with the guy that won. And so, and boy, was I wrong. And Amon Ra Amon Ross St. Brown, a uh, fifth or sixth round pick um, from last year. He is a sensational talent. He had 184 total scrimmage yards, including a big touchdown. And I also congratulate Aiden Hutchinson with a massive monster three-sack game in his second career game to basically just obliterate wins and just harass him the whole day. Jared Goff had also another a perfect game, essentially. He threw for 256 yards, four TDs, no interceptions. And they needed a lot of those big uh, plays at the end there because, like I said before, they were up 22-0 after the half. By the second half, the Commanders outscored uh, the Lions 27-14. But, obviously, with that kind of score, that wasn't enough. Um, 
And I just think with the Vikings, I, I think they are, to me, if they how they play against the Eagles or how they look against the Eagles, I think they are clearly the best team in the entire NFC through week one. If they can beat the uh, Eagles in a convincing way or at least, you know, by, by 10 or more, I think, again, I just think with the Lions, like, they're just not that, that way with the Vikings. Like, the Vikings are mad because they know that they should have beat them if it wasn't for that, you know, prevent defense from Mike Zimmer, which essentially I thought cost him his job. But, also, I just love what the Vikings offense was. Justin Jefferson had nine receptions over 180 yards, two touchdowns, and only about 227 passing yards. Um, and I just don't think that the Lions' weapons, they're really, outside of St. Brown, really that effective. I, mean, I guess Hawkinson is their second-best weapon. But he's made just a few nice catches, but he hasn't been that big of an uh, impact maker. And I think the Vikings, if you're going to give me Kirk or Golf, Kirk's roster against Golf's roster, I think Kirk's roster is just much more better. And I think O'Connell will outcoach Campbell in that game next week. But the reason why I'm taking the Lions plus 7.5 is both games, look this up, ladies and gentlemen, both games last year were both decided by two points. And it was a Greg Joseph field goal and the Lions scoring that touchdown, which basically caught, gave the win and loss to their respective teams. So I think seven and a half with how good the Lions have been. They lost a three against Philadelphia and they won by nine against the Commanders. So seven and a half or seven and a half there. With how good the Lions have been the last two weeks. I think that is way too many points. Give the Lions their respect. I think they cover. But I think the Vikings just are better coached, have more talent, and I trust Kirk Cousins to make a few more plays than Jared Goff. So, so that's why I like... Uh, Detroit here, plus 7.5, and Minnesota straight up. The next game, the Baltimore Ravens over the New England Patriots. This is one to where the Ravens blew their largest lead in franchise history. Or it, it tied their largest one lead in franchise history. They blew a 21-point lead in the fourth quarter, 35-14. to 14. The, last time, the other time that they blew a 21-point lead was on October 5th, 1997, against the Pittsburgh Steelers many moons ago. And I said that before. Um... But the difference to me in this game, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the Ravens, or when you are playing the Dolphins offense against the Patriots offense, two totally different offenses in terms of who's running them, the talent they have, and the quarterbacks that are there. Okay. Tua has Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, uh, Mike Gusecki. You know, they have Chase Edmonds and Raheem Moser. Like, he has a lot of talent and moving up and down the field with speed. Also for the Ravens, this was the first time the Dolphins beat Baltimore in Baltimore since 1997. So, no, 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 like that. Uh, we, are not, we are not playing that team this coming week in New England. We are playing the New England Patriots led by Michael McCorkle Jones, Mac Jones, with the immortal weapons of Kendrick Bourne. Jacoby Myers, and Nelson Aguilar, who caught his second longest catch of his career on the 44-yard touchdown pass at the end of the first half yesterday. So, that's the difference for me in the game. I think Mack is actually probably a better pure quarterback than Tua, but instead of facing Mike McDaniel and the complex and creative offensive mind out of Miami, we're facing Matt Patricia, the former defensive coordinator for the Lions, or the former defensive coordinator and the former head coach of the Detroit Lions, who looked absolutely abysmal. We are facing John New Smith and Hunter Henry, who in this Patriots offense, I believe a combined 53 yards, and they're both making 12 and a half, or their average annual salary this year for both of them is $12.5 million. So this is something where, could the Ravens secondary kind of maybe get burned through double moves and get Kendrick Bourne? Sure, but this is Kendrick Bourne. If Kendrick Bourne is taking the top off the defense, if Jacoby Myers is sl slashing through this defense, the Ravens are not making the playoffs because our secondary was embarrassed and it, John Harbaugh said it. It is how the Ravens respond to that moment that's really going to determine how the rest of our season goes. Um, I also want to graduate Tucker. He's getting, Justin Tucker with that big 51-yard field goal. He's now kicked 49 consecutive field goals in the fourth quarter. The greatest pure kicker of all time. He's not the go because he's not Vinatieri. I still think Vinatieri, I don't know if Tucker's going to be able to play long enough to get the points or the championships, but the greatest pure talent kicker is still automatic Tuck, Justin Tucker. And I would just say to Ravens fans, like, I, I just explained it again. We are not facing the Dolphins' weapons this time. We are facing the Patriots' weapons. And if Mac Jones can look like Tua, and we can make Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar, Hunter Henry, and Jonu Smith look like the Dolphins' offense, then this Ravens team is not making the playoffs. 
and I have a lot of concerns moving for the week after when we have the Buffalo Bills come to town. I still think the Buffalo Bills are going to kick our rear ends uh, from uh, Buffalo to Westchester to the other side of the state. But I think that that'll be for next week. And the Ravens lost to the Patriots two years ago. So, there's that. But I, I think, again, the, the Patriots don't nearly have the, the weapons. They don't have the offensive mind behind them. And the Pats just really look ineffective. Unless the Ravens shoot themselves in the foot, and we did not do that. Um, I, I guess we did have the one turnover. That was turnover on downs. But if we do not turn the ball over, I think that the Ravens' defense will play much better. And I think we have a fantastic game in our hands if we get the 2-1 and one in order to get ready for the bucket game we'll get from Buffalo next week. So that's why I like Baltimore here, minus three, and Baltimore straight up. The next game, the um, Cincinnati Bengals over the New York Jets. This is one to where, look, the Bengals' offensive line, they brought in Alex Kappa. They brought in Ted, uh, Ted Karras. They brought in Lyle Collins. They brought in a lot of help to sure up that offensive line, and it looks even worse than it did last year. Joe Burrow has been sacked 13 times in the first two games. That's the most since Chad Henney in 2014. They have said this. He is on pace to get sacked 100 plus times in the season. That is pure, like, Andrew Luck bonkers. Like, I, if he keeps getting him that much, that man's not going to be healthy by the end of the year. You just can't take a beating like that. And I guess in a pity way, Evan McPherson, after missing the 29-yard field goal and getting the extra point block, he was 3-for-3 three three yesterday for the Bengals, so that's a bit of a positive. Excuse me. <clears throat> bit of a positive. But when you look, when I look at what the Bengals have, you know, have ahead of them, they're playing the Jets, okay? The Jets, Flacco is 18-3 and three all time against the Browns. You know, he get 307 yards, 14 easy. He played a sensational game. And I also congratulate Ashton Davis. <laughs> he played one snap, but got the game-winning interception to win the game. Um, but this is one of those things, that if the Bengals have any semblance of hope, they are down to an 11% chance to make the playoffs. No team that started 0-2 made the playoffs after this point. They have to beat the Jets. They are just better than the Jets. And I know even Jet fans would say, hey, what was one of their big upset wins last year? They beat the Bengals. They beat the Bengals, not with even Joe Flacco or Zach Wilson. They beat the Jets with Mike White, the backup quarterback right now. So this is a weird moment here. To where, honestly, all hope for the Bengals and my confidence in them moving forward and picking them because they play Miami next weekend. If they crap the bet against the Jets, there's no way they beat the Dolphins team right now. So, this is just me saying, Joe, Jamar, Joe, Trey, or Joe, uh, Joe Mixon, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, Hayden Hurst, uh, the Bengals offensive line and all those guys I met, Trey Hendrickson, DJ Reader, Jesse Bates, uh, Eli Apple, Daxton Hill, Logan Wilson, uh, Sam Hubbard, all those Bengals. If you have any sense of pride, any sense of hope or emblems that you're not the bungles of years past, you beat this New York Jets team and you stomp their face into the mat. You curb stomp this Jets team if you want anybody to have any semblance of belief in you. Because if you don't, or if you lose for the second consecutive year to the New York Jets, then the Bengals are not making the playoffs. Joe Burrow might be a little bit more... Joe Burrow might be a little more choky Joe, and that whole $45 million plus contract, you might really have to think about maybe wanting to be a little more hesitant about it. Because that Bengals team is not nearly as good, and you can start saying, well, Joe Burrow was more on a happy ride. And I know his offensive line sucks, but Joe Burrow might be a little bit more, was a little bit more a magic carpet ride. And like one of my friends told me, maybe the Bengals were just a lucky run. And once they became the hunted, they couldn't stand up to the challenge. That's if they lose to the Jets. I don't think it happens. But with everything I just said, and with just the history of what this Bengals team has shown through the first two weeks, I'm going to take the Jets plus four and a half because, you know, nobody thought they'd lose to Cooper Rush. Nobody thought they'd lose to Mitch Trubisky. If they could lose to Mitch Trubisky and Cooper Rush, they definitely could lose to Joe Flacco. Uh, especially with the game Flacco coming off. So that's why I like the Cincinnati Bengals here straight up with the New York Jets plus four and a half. The next game, the uh, Philadelphia Eagles over the Washington Commanders. Uh, this is one to where I am taking the uh, Philadelphia Eagles here based off the fact of how Washington played 
Uh, and Riverboat Ron had horrible clock management and two point conversion management. Like in that second half, they could it was twenty seven, or it was uh twenty or twenty eight to thirty six, or, or it was like it was an eight. It was it, they had scored. They could have made it uh twenty. 21 to 28. It was 28 to 20. They got to kick the extra point, made it a one score game. Riverboat Ron decides to go for two, and he fails. And then later on, when he goes to the extra point, Sly misses the extra point. And he had to say, so in those like few plays, that's five points on the board that if the game kept going on, that could have made a huge difference in momentum and shifting of the game. Um, again, they were down 22 nothing early on. It was an absolute, like, the pantsing in the first half. Really, the only big positive player was Curtis Samuel with eight touches for 99 yards and a big touchdown. And also, this is a huge moment for the Commanders and Carson. This is Carson wants his first game against his former team since they traded in Indianapolis a few years ago. But it's just at the end of the day, like, all the good and bad that you see out of Carson, you just, that's the inconsistency there is why I'm taking the Eagles. Look, Carson might be a better pure thrower than Jalen. Carson might be able to make some deeper throws and more accurate throws. But Jalen just seems like he has better intangibles and he makes better decisions and he makes bigger plays, more plays of his feet. And I'm just going to trust that over Carson's up and down inconsistency. Could the Commanders win this game? Sure. But I just think with Carson's erratic play, he's going to give them a ball or two that coughs it up that gives the Eagles the victory. I think Jalen with his legs makes one or two few extra plays to get them in a game position to win. To run out the clock, a game-winning field goal with Jake Elliott. This is going to give me Jake Elliott or Joey Sly kicker. I'm going to go with Jake Elliott every day of the week. So, again, I think it should be an interesting game. And if Carson has one of his good games, the Eagles are could be could be his troll. But if it's more so the typical Carson, I'll take Jalen over Carson if it's typical Carson in that way. So, that's like the Philadelphia Eagles here, minus four, and the Philadelphia Eagles straight up. The next game, the uh, New Orleans Saints over the Carolina Panthers. Man, 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 the Saints. They were in a dogfight with the Bucks once again. And... Uh, Jameis, Jameis, Jameis. Famous Jameis had three interceptions through the second half. That's his 12th three-interception game. That's the most since 2015 when he came in the league. Uh, they did get a garbage-time touchdown to Michael Thomas. Who does have two TDs in his first two games back from injury. And, I, you know, I, I thought the Saints defense, they played their heart out, man. Uh, Marshawn Lattimore it kind of went a little bit over the edge after Fournette punched him, and then Mike Evans shoved him. And now Mike Evans could actually get suspended for that, which would be huge for Tampa. But I just look at this Saints team and go, dang, man, you had a golden opportunity. And Jameis, who was playing with four fractures in his back, Alvin Kamara also dealt with a rib injury. He was out for the game. But... I look at the New Orleans Saints and say, you blew a golden opportunity there to try to steal a game against Tampa. Then neither team had no, you know, no chance or no desire in winning. So, but I'm just going to take the Saints because I just trust the Saints roster, man. I think Jameis will play better. You're playing against a different Carolina team that's not nearly experienced. And you're going up against Matt Rule, who... Boy, did Matt Rule ever Matt Rule himself again. He got overruled by Brian Dayball. And Matt Rule now goes to an amazing 5-16 and 16 in one-score games. Talk about a guy that was given the bag at $60 million for seven years. And he has done jack squat nothing with that opportunity. God, I, I wish he would have stayed at Baylor. Actually, he, Dave Aranda's doing a better job at Baylor. Dave Aranda actually won the Big 12. So is Matt Rule one of the more overrated coaches? I'm just saying, like, Matt Rule was supposed to be this phenomenal building maker. He did it at Temple. He did it at Baylor. And he's supposed to do it at Carolina. But we're entering year three now. He's been on five different quarterbacks. And he's 5-16 and 16 in one-score games. Does anybody really think that Matt Rule really earned that money? Earned that shot? I, I, I don't. And I think he'll get, he'd get a college job. But I'd even start questioning a bit of his Baylor resume. Because Dave Miranda, even though I know Dave Miranda and them lost to BYU... And they're now, you know, top 15 team, or, you know, are bringing on a top 15 team who just got beat up by Oregon. Um, but at least Dave Aranda does have a Big 12 title to his name, so. <laughs> um, but, and also, even though I do want to give Christian McCaffrey credit, he did have a, uh, his most rushing yards since week 16 of 2018 season. He had one or two rushing yards, played really well. 
And at the end of the day, just kind of like Atlanta, I'm just going to trust Jameis to play a better game. And I think Baker just won't be able to do it. And if you're going to give me Dennis Allen or Matt Rule, I'll take Dennis Allen to make a few more plays or make one or two more stops off the talent of the Saints. Jameis, you know, excluded to win this game. Should be a very interesting game. I'm excited. The Panthers could win this, and that's why I'm going to take the Panthers plus three. Because if Jameis can't, you know, survive the game, I don't know if Andy can win it. You don't know about Kamara. And the Panthers have seen the play, you know, at least more competitive games. So three points. You know, it's a, it's a little hedge, but, you know, who knows. But I'll take the Saints here. Better talent, better coaching staff, and Matt Rule, I just think, they'll always steam away to find a way to lose this game to drop the Panthers to 0-3. So that's why I like the New Orleans Saints here straight up at the Carolina Panthers, plus three. The next game, the Los Angeles Chargers over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, this is one to where the char the reason why I'm taking Jacksonville here plus seven is the injuries to the offensive line. The all-pro center Corey Lindsley and Trey Pipkins, their right, uh, their right guard, left the game and did not come back. I don't know what, what their health situation is. And I look at Justin Herbert's rib injury. They said he was day-to-day. Um, I don't know if he'll play, but he'll definitely be limited and be hurting throughout this game. But I think the Chargers, they get Keenan Allen back. They already had J.C. Jackson back. You know, getting burned by Justin Watson isn't great. <laughs> um, this is one of those things to where the Chargers, even with Chase Daniel, if Chase Daniel, <coughs> excuse me, if Chase Daniel wins or has to go, I think the Chargers, if they get Keenan Allen back, have just way too much offensive talent that Chase Daniel can effectively manage and I'll play Trevor Lawrence and let the defense with Khalil Mack, uh, Joey Bosa, Tillery, uh, Sebastian Joseph Day, and all uh, Van Noy, Murray. Let that front seven get after um, uh, William Trevor Lawrence. And by the way, fun fact that, yeah, uh, Trevor Lawrence's name is actually not Trevor, if anybody didn't know. His actual first name is William, so I'm going to start calling him uh, Mr. William Lawrence, if you will. Um, and I, I think the Chargers win. Um, but I think that's why I took I, I took Jacksonville plus seven. I, I think... The Jaguars play too well that you could argue in the AFC, they are the sixth best team in the AFC behind, in my opinion, the Bills, the Chiefs, the Dolphins, the Chargers, and Ravens. You could put Jacksonville at six. I think they're better than Denver. I think that they're better than the Raiders. I think that they're better than the Jets. They're better than Pittsburgh and New England. Um, Because that, that's how impressed I was. But this Charger team, man, is just, I think, just way too talented. And I think they are ticked off about what happened. And I think even if Herbert can't go, I think Chase Daniel can do enough to win this game to get them to 2-1. So that's why I like uh, the Chargers here to win straight up, but it'll give me the Jacksonville Jaguars plus 7. The next game, the Los Angeles Rams over the Arizona Cardinals. The Rams played well. They were up 28-3. They almost blew it. Jalen Ramsey came up huge with a game-winning interception. Stafford had, you know, kind of up and down game. They ran the ball a bit better. Allen Robinson got his first touchdown of the Ram. And the Rams, you know, I just thought played well. The Cardinals, on the other hand, did not. And that was just more bad Raiders, bum Josh McDaniels. That showed maybe how bad the Raiders are compared to how good the Cardinals are. Even though I do congratulate the Cardinals. That was their third largest comeback in franchise history. Um, and on the game-winning two-point conversion, Kyler ran around for 80 yards, which was insane. I congratulate Byron Murphy for getting that 69-yard fumble recovery touchdown. Though he pulled, he almost pulled a Leon left to Sean Jackson. I think you realize that he almost dropped the ball out of the end zone, which would have been a touchback for the Raiders, which probably would have had that game was going. That might have been a tie. So thankfully, he had just crossed the line with the ball before he dropped the ball. So it counted, and the Cardinals won. Uh, but in this one, though, I'm going to take the Rams. Like, the last time I did this with the Rams-Cardinals, I might get burned, but the last time the Cardinals played the Rams, they smoked them. I think these two teams are different, and it's going to be a different game. And I, I don't think the Cardinals are going to look as bad, but you're going to give me Sean or Cliff, Stafford or Murray. The Stafford offense, DeAndre not being there, James Conner being hurt. I think the Rams just have just more of the advantage. If Stafford keeps throwing turnovers, that'll put him back in the game. But uh, give me the uh, L.A. Rams here. Healthier team, more confidence in coaching, better quarterback. And I just think, I, I don't think Kyle is going to be able to run around and make that much improvisation against a much better Rams defense compared to the Raiders. So that's like the Los Angeles Rams here, minus four and a half. The Los Angeles Rams straight up. The next game, uh, the Atlanta Falcons over the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, this has been, this is one to where I'm going to take the better team. I think, I know Seattle technically they're 500 and they do have the win. But 
Seattle only scored one special teams touchdown from Michael Jackson. From Mike Jackson. The king of popping the ball out was able to get, you know, uh, or, or actually it was the other rookie that got the block, and Michael Jackson picked it up. Um, and also, here's a fun fact for people that didn't realize. Geno Smith, in the two second halves this year, he's only combined for 75 total yards. Passing yards and sacks, he's only combined for 75 total yards. So, that's something where I just, I like what the Falcons have been doing. You know, like, I, I know, you know, the Falcons, they looked absolutely dreadful. But hey, they started to make a little bit of comeback, and they made some big plays. They got Riley Dixon, uh, you know, the block punt. They got Stafford to throw the second pick uh, to, I forget who it was, but they got that. And it wasn't for Jalen Ramsey making the play of, you know, play of the day with that jump pick. The Falcons could have maybe pulled a reverse 28-3 comeback. It's kind of funny, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I also think Atlanta's been more consistent, and Mario has been more efficient. So, that's, um, that's why I'm taking the Falcons. Could the Seahawks win this game? Sure. But give me Atlanta here. More consistent play, better defensive line. And I just think Mariota outplays Geno in this type of game. That'll be just interesting to watch. So that's why the Atlanta Falcons here, plus two and a half, and the Atlanta Falcons straight up. And the, la- the next game, Buccaneers over Packers. Rodgers now 24 and 5 against the Bears. Um, he's also 5 0 after week one loss. Tampa's never lost to Rod or Brady's never lost to Rodgers in Tampa, 0-2 against him. Um, and I'm just gonna trust the Tampa defense. Uh, you know, the Vikings defense has played, you know, really well. And I think the Bucks defense is just as good. Even if Brady doesn't have Mike Evans due to suspension, Chris Godwin due to hamstring injury, Julio Jones due to injury, uh, his offensive line's banged up and shot to you know what. I just think the Bucks defense, once again, in that Tampa Heat, play a good enough game against a limited Packer, you know, offensive line and Packer receiving core that they are able to hold on. I don't think they run the ball as much. I think Rob Rogers makes one less play than Brady in those moments. Okay, so um, should be an interesting game. I think after a while, Green Bay and uh, after how Tampa's looked, Brady for the first time was under 100, uh, 200 yards in, in in the game against the the Saints. People, I think, my people might take Green Bay and kind of go, "Oh, that's a huge win." Rodgers played a bit better. Rodgers looked bit but I just like Tampa's defense is just a whole different animal. So that's why I like Tampa Bay here, minus three, and Tampa Bay straight up. The final two games, the 49ers over the Broncos. This is one to where the Denver Broncos have the eighth most total yards in the NFL, but they're 26 in points. Russell Wilson in six drives in the red zone has managed four field goals and two turnovers. They don't even have a red zone touch. And I know I'm going against the grain here. Russell Wilson in his career is 16-4 and four against the 49ers. And he's won 70.2% of his games in prime time. But ladies and gentlemen, you got Nate, Nathaniel Hackett. Nathaniel Hack. Nathaniel the Hack Hackett and Kyle Shanahan. I'm not the biggest Kyle Shanahan fan. But Shanahan with Garoppolo and that offense will put on a master clinic against Nathaniel Hackett and that team. I think the Broncos, if Russell can make some plays... He's, he knows the Niners. He knows the system. He knows a lot of the talent. Um, I think he made competitive, but I just don't feel really good in that. So I'm going to test trust the coaching and Jimmy at, at, at the helm to beat a Denver team that I think is, unfortunately, a little more overrated than I, I wanted them to be. So that's why I like uh, San Francisco here against the spread and the pick And finally, the uh, Dallas Cowboys over the New York Giants. Uh, ba- Daniel Jones has never beaten the Dallas Cowboys. I know he's played really well. I know they've done really well. Uh, they're the, the most surprising 2 and team. They got Cano, 56-yard field goal. But in this type of game, Monday Night Football, I think Cooper Rush is a better quarterback than Daniel Jones. And I think Cooper, with, with the running game, the confidence of that defense, with that Giants offensive line as shaky as it is, I think the Cowboys are able to eke out another grinding, tough victory. So, that's why I like Dallas here, plus 2.5, and, and Dallas straight up. So those are my picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, and subscribe. Please check out the NFL YouTube prognosticators page for people like Andrew Warren, Bridgewater's Finest, uh, Half Moon's Picks, uh, the Blind Canadian Cat, Martin Wong, all those guys and gals that make predictions just like I do. And until next week, this is Matt the NFL Fanatic signing off. Until week four, so long.